All right, let's get started. So the Uyghur genocide narrative. So the genocide narrative really didn't emerge until 2019, but even before then, around 2018, we saw reports, we saw these bogus studies that were done, which claimed that there were 2 million, 1 million detained in concentration camps in Xinjiang. And then it turned to genocide uh, uh, around uh, the same time that the United States under Donald Trump began to ramp up this new Cold War. And so these are very serious accusations. And it was all around this, one ethnic group in China, the Uyghurs, in a particular province, Xinjiang province. And uh, one thing that I, you know, really do regret is I actually visited China in 2019, late uh, December, and headed to Xinjiang for three days. We were in Urumqi for three days. And I didn't, you know, there was a lot of tension at that time between the United States and China around this issue. And it, I, you know, I was told by our travel guide that we should try not to make ourselves out to be those kind of Westerners who are taking so many pictures, being suspicious around security forces, because uh, there were a lot of suspicions about infiltration and about uh, the dangers of what this human rights propaganda that was being told about China really posed to the country. And so I didn't take as many videos or pictures as I might have liked, but, you know, I was there and we were walking the streets and I spent three days in a room chi. And while it wasn't a significant amount of time, it, it was enough to get a sense, especially when you travel across Xinjiang province, which is a very mountainous region. Uh, the cities are very spaced out between each other. It's one of the more historically impoverished regions of China, just given its location, given its land, you know, isolation in so many ways, economically. Um, and it, it was one of the last provinces in China to be lifted out of extreme poverty, uh, which uh, happened around 2019, early 2020. But when I was there, you know, it was clear what people thought about this narrative, right? They, they didn't have many thoughts about it because it didn't really enter into their discourse. Genocide wasn't something that they understood in their own context, in their history. Uh, these concentration camp narrative wasn't something they understood. Uh, people thought of themselves as being both part of their ethnic group and part of China. Many people identified as both. Um, I saw a lot of the development that ha was happening there. And people talked about their confidence and feeling like things were going in the right direction economically for them. So, you know, we as a group got a good sense of the real Xinjiang, right? That... Uh, this province had, had been through so much under development over the course of decades, if not centuries, and now it was really entering a modern period. I mean, there is a high-speed rail train there. There is modern infrastructure. Uh, there is so much more economic development, especially in the cities. And now, with this announcement before this Associated Press article of Xinjiang, being uh, the most traveled to a part of the world in terms of tourism, it really bursts the bubble of this narrative that Xinjiang is this scary, big open air prison a la Gaza, a real open air prison that Israel uh, keeps in utter destitution and misery, right? That's, that's not what I saw in Xinjiang, nothing. I know people who have been to Gaza and, uh, you know, uh, and I've watched... Abby Martin's film, Max Blumenthal's film, <laughs> Xinjiang does not look like that. Eremuchi or Erumchi, the capital, does not look like that, right? Um, there's very, there's, it's very clean, uh, very little poverty, modern infrastructure, people speaking all sorts of languages because it's, uh, although Uyghurs are the majority in that region, there are many more languages than that that are spoken in uh, that region, and even in the city of Urumqi, where you know there are Kazakhs, there are Tajiks, there's so many ethnic groups 
that live there that uh, speak their own language as well as Mandarin because it's contrary to this idea that learning Mandarin is some kind of genocidal colonial policy. Learning the national language actually helps integrate the economy, integrate all people who live in China into what is a fast growing economy and one that has decent jobs opening up uh, in, in very highly specialized sectors like tech, for example. So uh, that, that's the sense of Xinjiang that I got, right? And it was just incredible to see how integrated it had already become in just a few decades, right? Xinjiang, just a little context, was the target of this East Turkestan Islamic movement, now called the TIP, the Turkish Islamic Party, which is a terrorist group and had been recognized by the UN and the United States as a terrorist group. The US took it off the, the terrorist group list uh, recently within the last year and a half, two years. But the ETIM had organized thousands of attacks over the course of 26 years, 1990 to 2016, killed hundreds of people. This includes the Urumqi riots, 2014, 2009. And people died. And so, yes, there was punishment for those individuals. Uh, and there's also a lot of re-education being done for those who are caught up in that kind of life. And, um, and, and it's incredible to see the bounce back, what only four years of peace about, right? Real peace, uh, where these attacks were not commonplace. There hasn't been an attack since 2016. It was incredible to see how much has been able to be addressed. And I saw a lot of mosques in Xinjiang. You go to the Grand Bazaar in Arumchi, for example, and that one of the biggest mosques is actually open to the public, is there. Um, so this whole idea that there's no mosques in Xinjiang is completely ridiculous. But I'm going to go over some materials uh, on Twitter. But I want to first shift gears a little bit. And look at uh, this article. So I'm going to share my screen. So it's a big deal um, uh, that the Associated Press has kind of turned on this narrative a bit. So give me a minute. While you're waiting, you know, like the stream, subscribe to the channel if you have not. Uh, also, uh, think about if you can. Uh, subscribing to my Patreon. Um, I'll be plugging that here and there. Soon I will be doing this on a more full-time basis. Looking forward to launching a program called the International Transmission again. So uh, with any, uh, without further ado, let's share this article. Okay, let's see how it looks. First, uh, nope, this is the wrong one. Sorry about that. All right, let's try that again. I have a lot of tabs open, guys, so bear with me. Um, okay, 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 Associated Press, so there it is. All right, guys, all right, this, this is it. All right, so this is the article I wanted to talk with you all about. It is called Terror and Terrorism, Tor <laughs> Terrorism, Terror and Tourism, Xinjiang eases its grip, but fear remains. And so I think this article will provide me many opportunities to go to the counter narrative that I think is the correct one when it comes to Xinjiang. So let's begin. Written by Dake Dake Kang, Dake Kang. All right. So that looks like a pseudonym, but uh, I won't make any judgments there. Um, all right. So Xinjiang, the razor wire that once ringed public buildings in China's far northwestern Xinjiang region is nearly all gone. Now, I don't know what they're talking about, about this uh, ringed uh, razor wire. Very rare. Uh, I, didn't, I, I don't think I saw any of that when I was in Urumqi and I walked a mile. I mean, cities in China are really big, guys, just FYI. And so I walked miles across that city and I didn't see any of that. But all right. So gone to our middle school uniforms in military camouflage and the armored personal carriers rumbling around the homeland of the Uyghurs. Gone are the many surveillance cameras that once glared down like birds from overhead poles. 
and the eerie eternal wail of sirens in the ancient Silk, Silk Road city of Kashgar. Okay, well, surveillance cameras. There are surveillance cameras, uh, more, much more surveillance cameras, many more surveillance ca cameras in uh, Rumchi when I was there than anywhere else. And that was because of this real threat of extremism and extremist activity, violence. Now, of course, a lot of words are said here with no evidence. I've never seen any report. I didn't see it when I was there, and I haven't seen any report of this. Uh, armored personnel carriers and military cam middle school uniforms and military cameras. I've never even seen pictures of that in the mainstream media trying to make it up, you know. So, so this just goes to show how f this is just a bunch of words that has, has never been verified in reality. This is just storytelling, and that's what I often say about the corporate media when it comes to China. There's a lot of just downright storytelling. So let's move on. Uyghur teenage boys, once a rare sight, now flirt with girls over pounding dance music at rollerblading rinks. One cab driver blasted Shakira as she raced through the streets. <laughs> First of all, there ain't there ain't no censorship of music in China as long as you ha you know there's the Great Firewall, but if you have VPN, which like ninety nine percent of people do, if you um, you know, and this uh, Western music is not barred from China, so that's that's just ridiculous there. And then Uyghur teenage boys once a rare sight. When when have they been a rare sight? That's trying to insinuate that they were all in these camps, right? That was never the case. Uh, actually, recently, uh, China has actually, and this has always been the case, has always stretched its one-child policy, which is now two-child policy nationally. But Uyghurs actually, Uyghur families and, and ethnic minority families can have three children now. Um, uh, or at least they could have three children when the two-child policy was first instituted. Now I think it's been two children across the board for all ethnic groups universally. And a lot of this was because of the uh, various economic needs of the rural areas versus the cities. There's been a lot more balance of development of late. So this hasn't been so much of a problem. Uh, now there's kind of a concern about uh, you know, when I was there and I spoke to a few women, there's a concern about not enough male partners. These are just more some practical things that have some economic consequences as well. But um, the birth rate actually for Uyghurs and ethnic minorities as a whole has gone up dramatically. Population has risen dramatically over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. So this is, again, just storytelling and has no basis in reality, right? It's fiction. Four years after Beijing launched a brutal crackdown that swept up to a million or more Uyghurs and most uh, other mostly Muslim minorities into detention camps and prisons, its control of Xinjiang has entered a new era. Chinese authorities have scaled back many of the most draconian, invisible aspects of the region's high-tech police state. The panic that gripped the region a few years ago, ago has subsided considerably, and a sense of normality is creeping back in. What, what panic? It, it's just, wow, you, go, you walk the streets of Urumqi, there, there is no panic. I was there two years ago. There was no panic, okay? People were living their lives. Um... Descent. This is all made up. I mean, this idea that people there were scared of concentration camps. No, only the folks that these pro State Department think tanks, uh, people like Darren Byler, and I'll talk about him in a little bit. People like him, people like Adrian Zenz, folks that they talk to, these exiles from the ETIM who live in places like Turkey and all across the West. The United States, right? The, uh, Rashan Abbas, for example, who I know uh, Daniel Dumbrell and others have spoken to who used to work at Guantanamo Bay, right? These uh, NED funded organizations, World Uyghur Congress, et cetera. Yeah, they were panicking. But China, uh, there was no panic in China um, in relation to uh, 
this this issue. There wasn't an issue there, right? Actually, there was peace there. And once peace started to occur in Xinjiang, that's when this Uyghur human rights narrative suddenly popped up, right? It was only, it, it wasn't a problem before 2016, right? It was about 2017, 18, when this became a problem. That's because the attacks stopped and China's policies were effective. So let's keep moving on. <sighs> but there's no doubt about who rules. And evidence of the terror of the last four years is everywhere. Sure. It's seen in Xinjiang cities where many historic centers have been bulldozed and the Islamic call to prayer no longer <laughs> rings out. <laughs> That's false. I was there. The, the call to prayer happens. I, I can show you videos, not my videos, but it, the narrative of this so-called police state in Xinjiang is so laughable when you can literally go on something like TikTok or, you know, any social media and find people who actually live there and who just show you what daily life is like. And it just bursts asunder this, these kindergarten narratives. They're, they're so elementary and amateurish. It's, it's, it would be laughable if it didn't have such a big impact. It's seen in Kashgar where one mosque was converted into a cafe and a section of another has been turned into a tourist toilet. A tourist toilet. Not a public toilet because there are public toilets everywhere in China and that's a really cool thing. But it's turned into a tourist toilet. So again, this idea that there's some kind of colonial occupation happening. It's deep. It's seen deep in the countryside where Han Chinese officials run villages. Now, the, the, the Communist Party of China is not just Han run. It has members of all ethnic groups and uh, the villages are, are actually run locally and it begins uh, at the village level. And if you watch Robert Kuhn's really good documentary on poverty alleviation, although he doesn't, uh, I, I don't remember if he talks about Xinjiang, but he has so many, uh, so much coverage of the rural areas and how these kind of democratic uh, processes happen in order to make decisions around poverty alleviation. And that's, that's kind of how uh, at the very lowest level, at the most local level, the village grassroots level, things are run and then things move up almost in kind of like a direct democracy model where uh, those who have been elected to run the local village and, and lead it and lead these meetings then reports to the up the next uppermost level of government and then there are more elect than they elect above them and that's kind of how the governance system in china actually works it works at the lowest level township grassroots level there are elections among the people for who's going to represent them and then that person elects the next among uh, the rest of the town the representatives of the townships it's a very complex system and, and we have friends of socialist china published a great article on China's socialist democracy by Roland Bohr, which you should go check out when you can, but not now. Stay here because we are not done. So with that said, you know, I don't even want to, I don't even want to keep going with this before showing some counter to this. And I, I made a thread about Xinjiang in relation to our, our good friend, sarcasm, Ryan Grimm, who, um, let me just, uh, share another video um oops oh well okay we're gonna share another one so i want to share not this one i want to share this one okay um i'm gonna show you my xinjiang thread because ryan Grimm, you know became really offended at what um kim iverson in her segment on taiwan which then really evolved into a conversation about China and Xinjiang, and it wasn't a good conversation. So I made this thread, okay, um, which I think, you know, he kind of mirrors a lot of the arguments in this article, where while they're saying there's a new era and there's no more genocide, right, there's not this open terrorism, right, of Uyghurs, he was kind of 
parroting this article and saying that there's all these cultural issues happening, right? China is repressing and oppressing the culture of Islam. Well, I say that he told a lot of lies during this segment and lie number one, people can't practice in mosques. You just saw in the AP article. It, it said that mosques are being bulldozed and you don't hear the call to prayer. Well, this is a call to prayer. Let me see if um, actually if the um, audio is um, shared. So let me, oops. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, bear with me here as I am my own producer as well. So, okay, yes, tab audio is shared. So I want to just, you know, this is a call to prayer, okay? Can you hear that? So that's a call to prayer, guys. That's exactly what that that's called. Um, and that's in Xinjiang. Now we can move on. And a similar claim was made. Uh, am I unmuted, actually? Yes, I am. So a, a similar call was made, uh, you know, a claim was made in this AP article that they're in Kashgar, right? All, all this bad stuff is happening. You know, culture is being decimated. And, you know, it's laughable because you just go and there you go. The city, ancient city of Kashgar. Does this look like cultural oppression to you? Uh, I'm going to put on the sound, but I just want to say that the, these are traditional practices in public, right? You just go on TikTok and there are people from the region who are showing this. And no, we can't believe Radio Free Asia when Radio Free Asia, that CIA conduit, says to us that this is all staged. That's uh, blasphemous, but here we go. Uh, pretty cool. You see the ancient city of Kashgar there. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, this is just basic stuff, right? So obviously he claimed, Ryan Graham and the Associated Press on the same team here, claim that the genocide in Xinjiang is cultural, but this does not look like a cultural genocide to me. It looks like a pretty fun time, to be honest. And guess what? There's a lot of this going around in, 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 in Xinjiang. And when I was in Arumchi, here's the video I took that I want to show you all. Um, that's uh, the minaret, and that's attached to the public mosque right there. So here you go. So it is, and it's very good food and drinks as the, um, you know, as people in the chat are, are saying. So this food is very good. I mean, it's halal. There's like, you know, there's a lot of good traditional Uyghur eats. Um, and also, you know, there's just been a kind of a meld, a mixing and melding, a kind of a global feel in Xinjiang where you can get all kinds of different foods um, with respect, of course, to the practices of, of the Uyghur population. So I'm going to stop sharing that um, and I'm going to go back and let's look a little bit more at this article. All right. And uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on that article, but let's go back to it because I want to move on to something else while I have you all. Um, so let's go back real quick to this article. Okay, sharing it here. Okay, so um, 
you know, all these stories, a bike seller's arms widen in alarm. When he heard I was a foreigner, he picked up his phone and began dialing the police. <laughs> Actually, that's quite funny. Um, I might do the same thing if I lived in a place that has been the subject of propaganda for so long. If I saw a, um, a gringo mainstream media journalist, I may also be very concerned that, um, that there was infiltration going on because honestly we know that the intelligence apparatus is very connected to the media and, and people in china know this as well so funny thing about that <laughs> so i was a foreigner dialing thing uh we in beijing we went to uh, a, a traditional chinese medicine hospital and, and people are very frank there it doesn't have the same hipaa rules in china you know people kind of just wait they're chilling in the office you get checked out and, and it's kind of like a group thing people are chilling in the office with you while you're getting seen by the doctor and um our friend who's white uh he had some stomach issues and so he went to this doctor and the first thing the doctor said was in in mandarin he says you know uh he turns to our our guide and he's just like why'd you bring this white devil into my office <laughs> it was one of the most hilarious moments um anyway that's that's an aside so yeah so anyway we're going through this um a convenience store cashier chatted idly about declining sales then was visited by a, the shadowy men tailing us when we dropped by again, she didn't say a word, instead making a zipping motion across her mouth, pushing us past us and running out of the store. Really, but there, there's no pictures of this. There's no video. It, it's just like, oh, look, that happened. And here's a picture of people doing hair. I mean, this is how disingenuous this is. This is like, I could tell a story about anything, uh, pull up a picture, put it on uh, my website and my publication, say it's the truth. This is absolutely ridiculous, shoddy journalism, and it's shameful. At one point, I was tailed by a convoy of a dozen cars. Really? Where's your... You can webcam anything out there. An eerie procession through the silent streets of Aksu and four in the morning. Anytime I tried to chat with someone, the minders were drawn close, straining to hear every word. Okay. It's hard to know why Chinese authorities have shifted to subtler methods of controlling the region. It may be searing criticism from the West, along with punishing political and commercial sanctions that, that have pushed authorities to lighten up. Or it may simply be that China judges it has come far enough in its goal of subduing the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities to relax its grip, a.k.a. here's a paragraph, all speculation. It's hard to know why China's authorities have shifted to subtler methods of controlling the region. Hmm, maybe because all of the methods you've been talking about actually never really existed in any real way, right? Maybe they don't exist in the way that you think that they've existed. Maybe you've just been making things up for more than three years and telling all these lies, not sourcing anything. Have you all seen one source in this article yet? One single source? There's no interviews, no images, nothing. And this is what I've had a problem with with, China, with this media apparatus and, and this propaganda war against China since the beginning. There's never anything credible coming out but stories, these fictional tales. Right. And Bloomberg did something around the time right before that, um, right before Biden slapped sanctions on renewable energy producers in Xinjiang, a story by a Bloomberg journalist who said that he was traveling in, in Xinjiang. He, he, you know, he was being videotaped, he was videoing it and he showed cars behind him as proof that he was being followed. It was all so orientalist and so racist, right? It, like painting China into this demagogic hateful place i mean it's just absolutely ridiculous that these white six-figure so-called stenographers of the foreign policy establishment have i mean if i to be honest i i i mean you know there has there there are tighter restrictions on foreign journalists now uh you know bbc was kicked out of beijing during the trump you know uh because of its terrible coverage on the pandemic and other things uh there's a lot of suspicion about foreign western journalists in china and for good reason this is the reason because they're stenographers of, of the foreign policy establishment um so anyway, moving on here's a nice picture look at that nice picture so nice but no 
Uyghur activists abroad accused the Chinese government of genocide. Okay. Pointing out plunging birth rates and mass detentions. Population has grown in Xinjiang autonomous, you know, Uyghur autonomous region. And Uyghurs continue to be a big part of that, but uh, forget it. Uh, the authorities say that their goal is not to eliminate Uyghurs, but to integrate them and the harsh measures are necessary to curb extremism. Regardless of intent, one thing is clear. Many of the practices that made Uyghur culture a living thing, raucous gatherings, strict Islamic habits, heated debate, have been restricted or banned. In their place, authorities have crafted a sterilized version, version one right for commercialization. Oh my God. Xinjiang officials took us on the tour of the Grand Bazaar in the city of Urumqi. I, I was there, which has been rebuilt for tourists like many other uh, cities in Xinjiang. Here, there are giant plastic bearded Uyghur men and giant Uyghur instrument. Uh, a nearby museum of traditional non bread sells plastic tiny non keychains, Uyghur hats, and fridge magnets. Crowds of Han Chinese snap selfies. I mean, that's just racist. There's no way that this gringo journalist in some kind of pseudonym knows the difference between a Han Chinese and the other 50 plus ethnic minorities there. So it's not just Han Chinese there. Actually, Han Chinese are, are, are still, a, a, they're a minority in uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And when I was there, it was clear that there was a bunch of different folks there. Um, so anyway, museumification of Xinjiang. Can you believe that? Museumification. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to go through the rest of this. Basically, this is one big, hey, look at these nice pictures. These are actually nice pictures. They, they prove the opposite, like that, that life is kind of going on there. But the whole narrative around this, these pictures, as you can see, right? These are people, these are people practicing. Where's the security? Where's the security? You know what I'm saying? Like, no, the security is outside watching the mosque because guess what? ETIM. They were targeting mosques, guys. They were targeting religious centers because these cities, which have such rich cultural tradition, just like, you know, what happens in Syria, right? Um, what happens in Iraq, right? These cities get targeted. These cultural uh, areas, they become the targets of this extremist activity that has been rolled back completely. And that's what Ryan Grimm was so offended by. Look, he's offended by this, guys. He's offended by people... Uh, being able to do this, do what they what they want to do, right? There, there is much more freedom in Xinjiang than ever. And this is great. This is talking about, oh, look, books in Uyghur language. That's so fake, right? Uyghur language copywriting is a Mao, uh, by Mao Zedong. Oh, my God. What's crazy about this is not only Mao, but it's Xi Jinping. You know, these are the people that are very influential in China because, oh, well, they just happen to lead a revolution and continue to lead that revolution. Um, here's supposedly a detention facility, you know, does, I don't even see any barbed wire there. So, I, you know, I don't want to go through the narrative because, you know, it's very orientalist. We can go on and on. This article runs thousands upon thousands of words, but I did want to review some parts of it, give you a sense of what they're saying right now. Basically what this amounts to is the, uh, is the narrative of Uyghur genocide. You know, there's genocide is not really in this article uh, other than referencing that some people have said, but they're really rolling back on that, right? The U.S. propaganda apparatus is going back on this a bit and saying, oh, no, bad things are happening there, but uh, it's not genocide. And so the narrative has collapsed, and it's collapsed for uh, many reasons. I mean, back in February, right, Back in February, there already were officials in the State Department, lawyers, the State Department lawyers, who said, looky here, this is February, right? This is a long time ago. Department lawyers concluded insufficient evidence to prove genocide in China. That was back in February. Despite Trump's declaration of a genocide upheld by the Biden administration, legal experts suspect China's behavior may fall short of an actual genocide. So, you know, this has been crumbling for a while now, and it's indicative of something larger. I think a legitimacy crisis, um, you know, so I'm not going to share any more screens. I'm, I might, I'm, uh, I'm going to do another segment now.